Thank you so much. Okay, um, can you see my screen? Yes, you can that means yes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, again, my name is Crystal Hickman. I um, This talk that I'm going to be presenting today is called The ABCs of Native Bees. So yeah, thank you for having me. And just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am an artist, also a photographer, and um, also a speaker, which you can see me doing here, but also in the photos at the bottom there. And regarding my artwork, I primarily primarily work with two things. I work with ballpoint pen and sugar. Um, you can actually see uh, these. this is the ballpoint pen work. This is my sugar piece up here. Um, I actually did this for about 10 years before I got into bees. Um, and as well as speaking, I, I do a lot of different speaking engagements. I've also done a TED Talk as well. And regarding my photography, I primarily photograph three things, bees, the, um, the flowers or the plants that they visit, as well as their ecosystems. Now, I primarily do this in California, but you notice the lower left-hand corner here, I actually travel out of the country a little bit too. This is in Belize, um, do the exact same thing, photograph, document bees there as well. So I'm called a community scientist, and a lot of people refer to this as citizen science. So um, a citizen science scientist is an amateur scientist who conducts scientific research in a field that they don't hold a degree in. But a lot of people, just because of um, the meaning of the word citizen has changed politically for a lot of people, um, opposed to whether or not you have a degree, it's whether or not you're documented. Um, so to be more inclusive, this is specifically happening in the English speaking world in the US, um, we started calling ourselves community scientists. So as a community scientist, like I was saying, I uh, photograph bees and their environments, document their behavior, notate plants that they're present on, and also keep track of things like times, dates, and weather. Okay, so how I got started. I don't know if anyone's seen this quote before. Um, but if the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then man would only have four years of life left. No more bees, no more man, uh, no more pollination, no more plants, no more animals, no more man, uh, attributed to Albert Einstein. So I saw this on Facebook, of all places, and of course, believed it was true, um, had never heard anything of the contrary. Um, also believed that it was something that Einstein said. Um, it wasn't actually until a little bit longer than I would like to admit later that I actually found out that this quote was not true and actually Einstein never said it. Um, this was actually something that was made up in the 90s, but I believed it. And like pretty much everyone else was reading it, I also thought it was about honeybees. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to go out there. I had been really wanting to get into ecology and I was like, I'm going to save these bees. And by bees, I meant honeybees. So this is when I went out with my cell phone. So before I had a camera and I was just taking pictures of bees because I was like, let me raise awareness for the decline in bees. And by bees, again, I meant honeybees. So just a lot, a lot of picture of just honeybees, like literally just honeybees. And then I took this photo and it's clearly a bee, but it's not a honeybee. And I was like, okay, this is really interesting. I had no idea what it was. So I went back to the people who I thought were bee experts at the time, beekeepers, and asked them, hey, what kind of bee is this? And they had no idea, which was also kind of interesting. So I ended up going back to Facebook of all places, and there was a group there called the Native Bees of the Americas. And in that group, there were a lot of people who were entomologists, people who study insects, and there were also militologists, people who studied bees. And the militologists told me, pretty quickly that this was a native bee, which is again, a term I hadn't heard before. And it was a female Andrina or a mining bee. And they also told me that it was actually native bees, not honeybees, which are the ones that are potentially threatened or endangered. Um, that's also how I found out that fake Einstein quote wasn't true. Um, so I ended up going back to all the places I'd gone before to photograph all these honeybees. And for whatever reason, for just months and months and months, I wasn't able to find any native bees and I had absolutely no idea why. Um, that was until 
I went to the Crescent Farms Facebook page of all places and the horticulturalist there, John had taken some pictures and um, they'd been posted on their Facebook page. It was about four or five species of bees that had been seen all in one day. And I, I thought this was kind of weird. I was like, why are there so many native bees here when I've been looking all over LA for months and I haven't found any. So I ended up going to the Crescent Farm and took these photos. And these are some of my first photos of native bees. I, I photographed these all within the same day. And one thing that's really great about the Crescent Farm is it's about an acre of nothing but native plants. So it was after visiting there, I started again learning about native plants. And I know you guys, obviously California Native Plant Society, you know what native plants are, but um, a plant is considered native if it occurred naturally in the particular region, ecosystem, or habitat without human introduction. So native plants can potentially have symbiotic relationships with native fauna. So save the native bees also means save the native plants. And saving plants helps save more things than just bees. It helps save a lot of different pollinators like birds, butterflies, bats, and et cetera. So the reason why there were so many native bees at the Crescent Farm at the LA Arboretum was because of the native plants. So this again, reworked everything that I was doing. So I had to look for the native plants to find these, these native bees. And also too, I know there's a lot of uh, confusion about honeybees and native bees. So I decided to just present some facts that um, I think are really helpful if you're just getting started with native bees. So first off, honeybees are not threatened or endangered. Hun uh, native bees are potentially threatened or endangered. Honeybees, the ones that are in the US are from Europe. Native bees, like native plants, are from where they currently reside. So they could be native to like the entire United States, they can be native to California, or they can be endemic to an area as small as your zip code. So it can get really, really small. Um, honeybees drink water provided by people. Native bees get all of their hydration from plants. So I know a lot of times people try to save the bees by putting native plants in their yard, but then they also put water out. So that water is attracting honeybees, which will actually outcompete the native bees for resources. So Good idea, good idea not to do that. Um, honeybees are also generalist pollinators and a lot of people think this is really good because they'll try and pollinate everything, but because they don't have those symbiotic relationships, they don't actually pollinate anything all that well. Um, it's been noted that they have about a 5% pollination rate. So it's pretty small or pretty low. Native bees can also be generalist pollinators, but they can also be specialist pollinators, meaning they can maybe pollinate just one family of plant, some of them just one genus, maybe even down to the species. Honeybees are also detrimental to native bees. So like I was saying before, they're all, they'll outcompete them for resources, but they've also been known to spread deformed wing disease or just deformed wing virus to bumblebees. Um, honeybees and bumblebees are actually in the same family. So the way that works is there's a mite called a varroa mite that will get into a honeybee colony. And some of the bees are infected, but not physically impacted by it. So they'll actually go out to whatever flowers are around since they're generalist pollinators, they'll visit a lot of different things. They'll actually infect the pollen and developing bees consume pollen. So bumblebees will visit those same flowers. They'll actually take the infected pollen back to their hive and they're developing um, bumblebees will be have deformed wing virus or they'll have very tiny wings. So I know a lot of times people have seen videos of people rescuing bumblebees with very tiny wings, they can't fly. It's because of their close proximity to honeybees. Um, one way to counteract that actually is to plant more native plants because diversifying, there's less likely to uh, spread the pollen, the infected pollen. Um, also um, native bees are threatened by climate change, which I'll get into a little bit more in a second. Um, honeybees live in colonies. Native bees, about 70% are ground nesting, 30% are cavity nesting, and 90% are solitary. Okay, so specialist pollinators. I decided to start out with my very first specialist pollinator. This is called a Perdita nasuda. And this is a bee that I saw when I was driving through Death Valley about two years ago, two or three years ago now. And this is really cool. Um, it's also a really great example of community science because if you look at the male, he's in the lower left-hand corner here. You notice he has this facial feature, it's called a clippius. It looks like a duck bill. Um, the way militologists have been studying bees for a very long time 
is by putting out pan traps, which is basically like a pan with some liquid in there. And pretty much anything that flies by will be attracted to it. And then they uh, end up perishing in, in it. And then militologists will actually take the, the bee specimens back to a lab and study them. So because militologists were studying bees that way, they didn't actually know what that facial feature was for. But after about 10 minutes of me actually just looking at them alive and photographing them, I saw this bee using the facial feature. So what the male is actually doing is he's holding the female's antennae on either side of this clippiest facial feature to stop her from flying off so he can try and mate with her. So not a super positive facial feature, but really cool um, community science discovery. And what was also really cool about this plant is the buckwheat, everything on it had a similar color of like yellow or red that really matched the plant. So it just, it really seemed like a lot of things just evolved together uh, or were attracted to this plant because of their coloration. Um, what's also really cool about this plant is this bee, since it's a specialist pollinator, you can actually find it by looking for this buckwheat in the desert. Um, so you'll find it in the Mojave Desert. So like Joshua Tree area, um, Death Valley, places like that. Another specialist pollinator, this is one that I actually, um, you can identify two species because of the flower that it's on. So whenever you see a Caliapsis pule, you'll see it on a desert dandelion because they collect pollen from there. Also, the males hang out on the desert dandelion because they know females will show up there. So a lot of times, if you're having trouble IDing a bee, you can actually look at the flower that it's on, and that's a great way to ID them. Another one, um, this one's really cool. This is a Perdita nisuda. And um, it is the smallest known bee in the United or in North America, potentially the smallest bee in the world. This bee is slightly under two millimeters. And if you look at the quarter here, there's, um, I put a patch of flowers on here. You can actually see how small the bee is. So it's about the size of a letter on a quarter. Um, this is the female, you can tell she's a female because she has the pollen on her back legs. And this is a male flapping his wings away. Um, and what's really cool too about this is this is my first time IDing a uh, Lassia blossom dialectus to species. This is a bee that's notoriously hard to ID to species. And a lot of people, again, to ID them, they pan trap them, they collect them in those uh, pans full of liquid. But because photography is getting so much better, I'm able to go out and take pictures of these and ID them to species. Um, there's not a key that helps me ID that I actually have to talk to the experts, but um, I just think it's really cool that with technology, the way people are studying bees is changing. Um, but yeah, I was just really happy to get an ID on this. Um, but what's also really cool about this sand mat, so it, this was in a neighborhood on a sidewalk. And I know a lot of times when people think of ecosystems, they'll think of like a whole forest or a desert, but this is about two feet by two feet squared. Um, all of these creatures lived on the sand mat, and they were all very, very tiny. Um, I think the largest one was this antlion, which was probably three millimeters. Um, this wasp right here was about 1.7, and this mite is actually one of the coolest creatures I found on the sand mat. It's about 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters. It's called the Paratar sodomus macropalpus, and it's the fastest land animal on Earth relative to its size. So if it was the size of a human, it'd run about 1,300 miles an hour. Um, so I just, I think it's really cool that all of this was in a neighborhood sidewalk that was potentially the world's smallest bee and the world's fastest animal relative to its size. So I wanted to show you guys this little video I made about this micro ecosystem. So what she's actually doing there is collecting pollen on her chest. She's going into a tripod stance, 
Then she's moistening it with her mouth parts and putting it on her back legs to transport later. So there's that tripod stance. And there's a little thrist right next to her. All right, so very cool little ecosystem. Oh, there we go. Um, so also symbiotic relationships don't just exist in the bee world. I know a lot of you guys know that already, but um, just in case, this is a wasp that actually is identified by the plant that it's on, California brittle bush. So whenever you see this wasp, you always see it on pictures of the California brittle bush. Um, also, it's not just in the insect world. Symbiotic relationships are in other uh, relationships as well. So I know a lot of people have seen Finding Nemo. That's how a lot of people found out about this one, but it's a sea anemone and a clownfish. So the clownfish actually attracts things to the sea anemone that the sea anemone will feed on. And the clownfish gets protection because it has a coating, so it won't actually get stung by the uh, sea anemone. So that's another example of a symbiotic relationship. Um, this is one that I like to bring up a lot. I know it seems very random because there are obviously not, no bees in this picture, but this is a symbiotic relationship that was impacted by climate change. So in Australia, in I think 2019 and 2020, um, there's a giant um, oceanic temperature gradient that normally happens every year, but because of climate change, it was really exacerbated. So what happened was Australia got a lot of drought and Eastern Africa, I know it wasn't on the news a lot, but um, got a lot of um, flooding. And I think actually the opposite happened last year. So the way it affected this, the way it affected the symbiotic relationship is um, there were a lot of fires because of the drought. So koalas that actually survived the fires, they didn't have anything to eat because a lot of their eucalyptus actually burned. So a lot of them started starving to death. But people really like koalas. They're really cute. They're large, they're fluffy. Um, they're just adorable creatures. So people stepped in to save the koalas that were actually starving to death. And I bring this up because the same thing is happening in California and a lot of other places as well to creatures that people don't think are as cute or fluffy like bees. Um, this is something that we see happening a lot, like even in the Santa, Mo Santa Monica Mountains, which is pretty close by. Um, so what can we do? There's a lot of things, but I think the two main things that we can do are document to raise awareness. And anyone can do this even in your own backyard. You can also plant native plants in your yard. This really helps to create a really healthy relationship. Um, also one way to document, I'm sure you guys all have this app already, but it's called iNaturalist. Um, just take pictures of whatever organisms you see. There's a lot of people on there like me who will actually ID things for you. I primarily do bees. Um, I created two bee projects one for California and one for Los Angeles. These projects actually just eliminate all the non-native bees, so primarily honeybees. So if you want to find native bees specifically in your area, um, just look for the California Native Bee Project. Well, and uh, this goes to a farm or a garden that I think is really amazing. It's in Arlington Garden. This is a great example of community science. Um, so there's a bee, it's a pretty common bee, but I hadn't thought, I hadn't seen it in the garden since 2018. Before that, I'd seen it pretty regularly. So I actually thought this bee was no longer there. But in 2021, um, Arlington, start, Arlington Garden started doing nature walks and bio blitzes. And on the very first one, someone actually took this photo 
of the bee. This is a Xylocopa sonorina. It's a male carpenter bee flying by. So this is an example of what happens a lot with nature. There's a lot of things to look at, but not a lot of people looking necessarily. So that means that we can miss things. So there are things that we might think are extinct or maybe endangered, but there might be like huge populations of them. It's just, there's not a lot of people looking. So we really don't know. So that's why I think it's really great for more people to get into community science, because we can just look more and see what's out there and also protect things as well. Um, so the Santa Monica mountains, this is an area I absolutely love visiting. Um, one thing that's really great about Santa Monica mountains is since I've been there so often, I'm actually able to predict what bees are showing up based on what flowers are there. So if you see these morning glories, this is a bee that you know will actually be around. So this is called the diadacia by tuberculata, and it has a symbiotic relationship with the morning glories. This is a female, and this is a female and a male keeping the population going. And what's really cool about these bees, they're solitary, but they live in aggregations. So it's like they have a neighborhood. They have their own little houses, but they all live close together. And the females create these little turrets these little structures that look like chimneys to protect their burrow. So this protects their burrow from like flooding, rain, whatever elements, but also any sort of like parasitic fly or wasp or other bee that tries to get in there and uh, parasitize their young. Um, this picture on the right is actually a female. She's sleeping. Um, I'm not sure if she just can't fit down her turret or what exactly, but these are her little feet covered in pollen sticking out of the top there. Um, and then my friend James filmed this video. So a lot of times people will look at these bees and go, oh, they're definitely social. But again, it's just like a neighborhood. So they all have their own little house. Um, and what's really cool about these bees is most solitary bees don't sting. So you can actually walk along uh, amongst these bees and don't have to worry about getting stung at all. Yeah, and this was, I think this was um, two years ago, and this was the largest um, aggregation population I've ever seen. I think there must have been like 100,000 bees. Um, it was in a parking lot that we ended up getting protected and closed off for them. Um, it was in Satwiwa on the, sorry, no, it was in uh, Mishimoko on the trailhead parking lot. And these bees are actually out right now. So if you go to Satwiwa or Mishimoko, they should be there. All right, so some other bees that you'll see also if the, the morning glories are out are Eucera, which are longhorn bees. Uh, you can tell this is a longhorn bee because he has the really long antennae. Um, so males are the ones that have the long antennae. You also see Dephoria. Um, this is another male that's sleeping inside one of the flowers. And two other flowers that I would look out for. Normally, I would say they start showing up in like February or March, but because of the rain, they got delayed a little bit. But Deerweed and also flowers in, I'd say, Asteraceae, so asters, sunflowers, things like that. If those flowers are out, you'll see these bees. So these top two are Anthophora, and they're different species. And I, um, I like to compare just like how different they can look. So this one on the left is a female. You could tell she's a female because she doesn't have this clippiest facial feature, which again, like the Perdita had it before with the duck bill. Um, this one just has a flat feature. She has the, uh, the hair on her face. She also has plumose hair or branched hair, kind of like a bird's feathers on her back legs. That's where she carries pollen. And you can see the male doesn't have that there, but he does have a little fan on his middle leg, which um, I think the species uses it to either cover the eyes or the antenna of the female when they're mating. Um, this one looks a lot like the Anthophora, but it's actually a Haberpoda. Again, he has the clippiest facial feature. This is a Hoplitis, um, and she doesn't actually carry pollen on her back leg. She carries it on the underside of her abdomen. So really cool bees there. Um, this one is also another uh, cool contribution to community science. So this um, bee, I was actually looking for it um, when these flowers were out and I, I, for whatever reason, wasn't seeing it. And then I, I looked closer at this bush that I was standing in front of. I thought it was covered with bird poop and it was actually this bee. So this bee looks like a lot like bird poop when it's sleeping. Um, this is a male megachile or a leaf cutter bee. This is a, another hoplitis. And if you see there, she has the pollen on the underside of her abdomen. This is a male osmia or mason bee. Um, males have the longer antennae. They also have a lot of facial hair. So it's a really good way to tell males from females. 
So climate change close to home, so um, this is in the Santa Monica Mountains still. I know it looks really brown here, but this is just a beautiful biodiverse ecosystem. And I spend a lot of time here every year looking for bees. Um, but because it's so beautiful and biodiverse, a lot of people have started moving there. And because of that, there's a lot of fire concerns. So let's see here. So what uh, a certain conservancy started doing was actually um, at the best of people who lived there was they started going through with a tractor and cutting down a lot of the native plants because again, people were concerned about fire. So this was actually an area that I've been really visiting regularly um, in starting 2021. And basically from February to July of 2021, I had photographed about 41 species of bees here. And after the tractors came through, I hadn't seen any of them. And I was really hopeful that the bees would maybe show up again next year, but I hadn't seen anything. The flowers weren't even growing back. Um, I did see some um, mallows starting to like, like little sprouts, but then they came through with the, the tractors again and cut everything down. Um, and this is something that's happening a lot in a lot of different areas, it's just land loss, habitat loss for creatures. Um, and one thing that's really sad about this is I actually never took a before shot of what this looked like, but it was really colorful. It was really blooming. It's just, it was beautiful. Um, but these are some of the bees that I actually photographed in this just very small location. Um, but yeah, this is something that's happening, not just in the Santa Monica Mountains, but in California and the U.S., basically all over the world. All right, so this is a map that explains uh, a lot of the biodiversity that's at risk in the United States and America. Um, one thing I really wanna point out is how dark red California is. So we have a lot of biodiversity here. So in relation to the entire United States, there's a little over 4,000 species of bees in the US, but California last year, someone actually counted, there's 1,643 species here. So we have more bees in the state than a lot of countries. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a lot of different diversity here. And that doesn't just, it isn't just restricted to bees, it's other creatures as well. Um, you can see it a little closely here. So one thing that's really good about this biodiversity map is a lot of times a lot of creatures are left out of these maps. Um, so this map actually includes things like bees, butterflies, fish, muscle, mussels, crayfish, a lot of flowering plants, things like that. Um, and then the Biden administration actually wants to do a plan that's called 30 by 30, which is protect 30% of the U.S. by 2030, because right now only 13% of the U.S. is actually protected land. And one reason why we have a lot of biodiversity here, I feel like maybe a lot of people aren't aware, is because we're a Mediterranean climate. So if you actually look at this map, you'll, you'll notice that Mediterranean climate, which is all the ones in green, it's always on the west side of the continent always next to the ocean and to the east is always a desert. So those are factors that indicate a Mediterranean climate. Um, so this is also about 2% of the earth's land, but it's about 20% of earth's biodiversity, which also reflects really well from California to the like, United States as far as biodiversity. Um, there it is a little bit closer. So one thing that's also really unique to Mediterranean habitats is our rainfall. We get winter rain typically, it's not happening this year as much, but um, yeah, normally like November to maybe January we get winter rainfall um, where most of the rest of the world gets summer rainfall. Um, another thing that I thought was really great about the Santa, Santa Monica Mountains is the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy has recently started to value the land in the Santa Monica Mountains as just a biodiverse ecosystem, not necessarily what it can do for people. So um, if anyone wants to develop there, they actually have to talk to the, um, the conservancy um, to show if there's going to be basically to show the, the long term, short term and long term harm that will happen there. So I think this is a really great step forward. Um, we'll see what happens with this long term, because I, I just think it's really great that people are starting to see inherent value in the environment and different ecosystems. Uh, so this is San Gabriel Mountains. 
Um, I visit this area a lot because I absolutely love this bee. So it's another solitary bee that lives in aggregations, but this one actually lives on the side of mountain walls. It's called an Anthophora bom bomboides. And my friend actually filmed this video. I'm gonna mute it because of their conversation, but um, this is a whole aggregation. Each one of those little holes has a turret there. And those are the bees. <laughs> But yeah, I just think that's that's really cool. And there's an ant lion that's crawling up there. They're probably going to parasitize some a bee hole. But yeah, just hundreds of uh, of bees living on the side of this cliff. All right. Also, uh, another place that I visited um, going back again this year in probably June or July, um, Trinity Alps. So I went to the Trinity Alps with a group of community scientists and militologists, um, the varying degrees of expertise in their field to look for this bee. Um, this is called a Bombus franklini. It's one of the four endangered bumblebees in California. And the last recorded sighting was in August of 2006. It was photographed by Robin Thorpe, who was one of the, I would say, world's leading bumblebee experts. And um, he recently passed away, I think, two or three years ago. Uh, but yeah, this was uh, my first like really, really big bee trip. Um, I'd never done a camping trip this long or backpack this long. Um, but yeah, basically I had a 30 pound back, uh, backpack on my back. And I, I go out in the desert all the time. So it was like nine miles up the mountain. I was like, no problem. Um, ended up taking me about nine hours. I was the slowest person. And we were there for about 10 days. Did not find this bee. Um, I was just really hopeful that we would just because it's in a very restricted location, very small location. Um, so I hope it's not extinct. Um, but it was actually just listed as endangered about two years ago. Um, which I think is really interesting just because it hasn't been officially seen since 2006. Um, but while I was actually there, I photographed this bee. So this is called Elasia glossum symbriallicus. It's a high elevation specialist bee and no one has seen it post 2000. And this is the first photo of a living representative of this bee. Um, hopefully when I go back, I'll get a photo of a male, but I was really excited to photograph a bee like this. I just, I think it's really cool. Um, also, when I went to Belize, I specifically went there to photograph a crepuscular bee, which is a bee that flies about 30, no, 90 minutes before sunrise, about 90 minutes after sunset. Um, had no idea how to find it. Um, also, no one had ever actually seen it in this location, and I knew I was going there the wrong month, so I was just like, it's probably not going to happen, but I'll just try. So what I ended up doing here was I kind of jerry-rigged like a kind of rinky-dink light light up um, area. So I actually hung two towels from my hotel room on clothes hangers and then I hung them on trees. Uh, so one of them has a black light um, and the other one has a just a regular flashlight. Um, so within 10 minutes of me hanging those up, the bee that I like was almost sure I wasn't going to find but was really hopeful showed up. Um, this is a mega Kylie or sorry, um, Megalopta genalis. Um, so really happy to find her. I think that's really, it's really cool. This is my first uh, crepuscular bee. And we have those in California as well. Um, Anza Borrego, which is a place I visit a lot. Um, there's this bee that I photographed two years ago. So this is called a Mega Kylie Brownie. And it's also the only photo of a living representative of the bee. And I think it's been seen three times post 2000. And I think maybe once or twice in the 80s or the 90s. Um, but yeah, I actually photographed this bee when I was looking for another bee that had a symbiotic relationship with the smoke bushes. Um, and I thought it was a completely different species, but I was just verifying with my friend, um, who's like an expert militologist. And he was like, Hey, this bee hasn't been seen for a while. So I was like, you know what? I got to go back and photograph it again. But there was a week gap between, um, me being able to go back. And the first day I was there, it was like a little over a hundred, but the entire week when I wasn't able to go, it was about 110. And the first day I was there, there was like nothing blooming just because it was so hot and so dry. Um, it was just these two smoke bushes. So this is what the smoke bushes are supposed to look like. This is what it looked like when I went there. Um, so when I went back the day, um, the day I went there, the temperature actually hit about 117 degrees. So super, super hot. 
And the first day I was there, I had seen maybe about a hundred native bees flying around. Um, but the day when I went back, as soon as I opened my car door, I just heard this really loud hum. And it's just, it was something that I've noticed happening a lot, especially when there's, there's a lot of droughts is it just honeybees kind of come out of nowhere and they'll just swarm whatever is flowering. So that's actually what happened here. Um, and I was just really disappointed. Um, but yeah, I walked around the, the bush and I didn't see a single native bee and completely random. This is what it looked like in the, the morning. These clouds showed up. It wasn't supposed to rain, but these clouds started rolling in and the skies just opened up and rain just started falling down and the hum of bees just disappeared. Um, it's a really cool double rainbow shut up. Um, but yeah. When it started raining, I walked around the smoke bush again, and I saw just one native bee, which was the one that I was looking for. She was drying herself off on a branch. So I got more photos of this mega Kylie Brownie when she was like posing very beautifully for me. Um, so this is an example of what happens with uh, drought that's increased by climate change, because it was the second year of the three-year drought. Also honeybees getting released into the wild and out competing the native pollinators. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of rare things that we could see out in not just the desert, but our yard as well. So I think this bee is a great example of what is still out there, even though people aren't seeing it. Um, so that brings me to native landscaping in our yards. Um, one thing that I th think that's really great in uh, that a lot of people are doing is a watershed approach. So what is a watershed approach? Um, a land area that drains to a common waterway, such as a stream, lake, estuary, wetland, aquifer, or even an ocean. You can kind of see it here. So if you notice the area with the wood chips or the mulch, it's actually higher than the area with the rock. So what happens is the water will actually drain down into the rock area. And people can actually use this to collect water. A lot of people use it for like a a sprinkler system or people will use them to collect water in water barrels. Um, but yeah, there's three key principles of watershed approach. So um, you want to build a healthy living soil that's biologically diverse and has a de developed structure like a sponge. So it'll hold a lot of water. Um, so it'll hold and release rainwater, cycling carbon and nutrients and promoting biodiversity for plant resiliency. Um, I always think biodiversity starts with the soil. So it's going to have a lot of things in there like earthworms, bacteria, anthropods, fungi, et cetera. So it's a lot of things that a lot of times people think aren't like they don't want in their yard. But a lot of times those things that people don't want in their yard, like the bacteria, the fungi, fungi or the anthropods, they're actually really good for your yard or for a healthy ecosystem. Um, so watershed approach also treats rainwater as a resource. So uh, retention can be accomplished by, like I was saying, creating small divots um, or basins or contours, also creating impermeable sources, surfaces. Um, that can be made permeable and used to capture areas, um, used as capture areas for reduction of water into the landscape. Also, rain barrels can be used to store water. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, about an inch of rain can give you a couple hundred gallons of water if you use a rain barrel. Um, yeah. And also, plant native flora. So, this is my friend Paloma's yard. And um, this is like a really great. Yard. She actually posted this photo on Instagram, and I'd never been to her house before. And uh, this photo is actually what caused me to go to her house. Um, but yeah, the first day I was there, I actually photographed all of these bees. So this is a female Xylocopa sonorina, which is a, the female to the orange carpenter bee that we saw before. You can tell she's the same species because she has the orange tint to her wings. This is a female Agapostomin texanus. She collects pollen on her back legs. You see some uh, plumose hair back there as well. Male osmia, again, long antennae, facial hair. This is a female Halictus tripartite, or sorry, no, it's a Halictus pharinosis. Uh, so it's a uh, Halictus with brown wings, uh, also a sweat bee. But what's really cool about her yard is this bee. So this is called a Perdita interrupta. And this is a bee that's typically only out in April and a little bit into May. Um, I think they got delayed a little bit this year because of the rain. But what's really cool about this bee is it's rare. And this bee has a symbiotic relationship with two plants. So poppies and cryptantha or the popcorn plant. 
So since poppies don't have, produce nectar, any bee or any specialist that um, wants to drink nectar, they have to have a relationship with another plant. So those two plants have to be in your yard. Um, and what's really cool about this bee too, is if you wanna make a contribute contribution to community science and you find that you have this bee in your yard, no one's ever found a burrow. So if you look on your poppies, um, the males just kind of hang out there and sleep while also wait for females. That's where all the mating happens. Um, look in your yard, maybe try and find a burrow. If you get a photo or a recording of it, that's a great contribution that you can make. Um, not only does she have the Perdita interrupta, but she also has this bee. So this is a Bombus crotchii. Um, it's one of the four endangered bumblebees in California. I actually took this photo in, um, at the Crescent Farm at the LA Arboretum, but after I went to her yard, she started looking out for bees more and she actually photographed um, this bee in her yard. So I think it's cool that not only does she have rare bee, but she also has an endangered bee. So again, that's what can happen if you plant native plants or do native landscaping. Also maintaining a native environment. I'm sure a lot of you guys know this already since you are the California Native Plant Society. But one thing that's really great is you don't need pesticides or herbicides or as much um, because pesticides, as we all know, they kill insects that benefit plants. Herbicides kill plants that benefit insects. So let's say for some reason, my friend Paloma didn't like the Perdita interrupter in her, in her yard and she decided to spray pesticides. Who's gonna pollinate the poppies? Let's say for some reason she didn't like poppies and she sprayed herbicides all over those. Um, where are the, uh, the Perdita Interrupta gonna go, the California poppy bee? Um, so these things impact more than just their intended targets. So a native landscape will naturally keep a healthy balance between insects and plants. So there's little to no need for pesticides or herbicides. And this creature is a wasp that I like to bring up a lot um, because it's an, what I like to call an indicator insect. So if you have this insect in your yard, it indicates that you have a healthy biodiverse ecosystem. And there's a lot of creatures that can be indicator creatures. Um, it's just when their life cycle relies on another creature to survive. And a lot of times those other creatures are things that we consider pests. So this wasp is also very small here. It is next to a quarter. So a lot of times you won't see it in your yard. Um, so maybe look out for very small flying things. Um, here it is at Arlington Garden. So this creature is an indicator insect because it relies on aphids. So this is a natural population control for aphids. So if you do have aphids in your yard, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I wouldn't spray pesticides to get rid of them um, because you can have these wasps in your yard to control the population. So what the wasp, the female wasp will actually do is something called ovipositing, or she'll stick a little egg into the body of the aphid. The aphid will swell up and become a cocoon or like a mummy for the developing wasp. And then the wasp, when it's an adult and ready to eclose or emerge, it'll actually chew its way out. And again, population control for the aphid. Uh, another creature that I like to call an indicator insect is a lacewing. So you see the egg here, the larva, as well as the adult. And these control things like thrips, thrips, millibugs, um, a lot of different creatures as well. Um, and what's really cool about all of these is I actually photographed all of these creatures on one patch of sunflowers. Um, I've photographed them at a couple of places, but one patch of sunflowers at the Crescent Farm. So I was talking before about how ecosystems can be really small. Um, the wasp and these, these aphids actually photographed on one single sunflower. Um, and this is a, a thrisp, like a really up close one that was on the flower as well. So again, a very, very tiny ecosystem. Um, and then I want to bring up some plants that you guys can put in your yard that will attract a lot of um, different creatures. So the first one um, I like to bring up is uh, buckwheat and also salvia. Um, these will attract a lot of generalist pollinators. Um, Asteraceae, so asters or sunflowers, also another great um, family of plants to put in your yard. Uh, so some creatures that will attract are uh, longhorn bees. So these are melisotis. You can tell they're melisotis versus the eucera that you saw before because they have bicolored antennae. So opposed to the black one, these ones have orange and black slash brown. So the males actually like to sleep on these and you also see a lot of uh, 
bees visiting them during the day. Um, poppies, and this is the popcorn plant or the cryptantha that I was talking about before that attracts the Perdita interrupta. There's close up shots of the male. Also, mallows in your yard, you'll find a lot of bees sleeping in them. Uh, this is actually a female bee, but a lot of flowers that actually open and close with the sun, you will find a lot of bees sleeping in them. Um, these are male Diodacia diminuta. I photographed these in um, California City. So um, basically what happens with these is um, right before the sun goes down, um, bees will actually go into them before they close and then they'll close around the bee. And then when the sun's about to come up, the flowers will open again, the bees will wake up and fly out. This is also another great flower, squash. Um, if you like squash, you can put this in your yard as well. There's a squash bee. So the males spend their entire adult life in the flower. The females actually nest right under them. This is a really, really early morning bee. So they're done by noon. Um, the flowers open up, I wanna say like whatever time sunrise is. So maybe like between six, 6.30. And uh, they basically do all their work there. But yeah, this is a great bee that you could have in your yard to pollinate the squash. Also, uh, red bud. Red bud is great because it'll attract a lot of carpenter bees, but it'll also attract a lot of mega chile or leaf cutter bees. So leaf cutter bees like to use the leaves to cut out these little um, crescent shapes. And then there's a female that actually has one rolled up. So she uses that to basically protect, uh, to wrap around the, the inside of a burrow when she's um, laying her eggs. So it's protection for them. Um, this is another female, Mega Kylie. You could tell, again, female because she has a long plumose hair on the underside of her abdomen, which is where she stores her pollen. Um, these are the carpenter bees. So again, the male and the female. So he's on red bud. bud. <laughs> this is at Arlington. And uh, this is actually at, actually, I think this is at Arlington as well. But yeah, carpenter bees. Also plant stems. So um, I was saying before, 70% of bees are ground nesting, 30% are cavity nesting. So this is one of the small carpenter bees in California. So a lot smaller than these guys. Um, so if you have um, plants in your yard that have pithy stems, like they're kind of a soft center, um, if you leave at least 12 to 18 inches, you actually create a nice like habitat or potential bee home for um, carpenter bees that will live in these stalks. And this is the male, you can tell he's a male because of the clippiest facial feature there. Female has a little line. Also, she has the plumose hair on the back leg. So this is a Serotina arizonensis. Um, also tall grass, another great habitat for bees. I know a lot of times people don't think of this, but it also attracts a lot of flies and wasps as well. As well. They like to sleep on them. Um, this is, I think, a Asteraceae stock with a lot of male carpenter bees sleeping on them as well. So another great thing to leave in your yard. Uh, these are two Anthophora urbana sleeping on, I think this is a red bud stem, or sorry, not red bud, this is flax. Yeah, um, this is a nomada sleeping on some dry grass. And I know it looks a lot like a wasp, but this is actually a parasitic bee. Um, also, pinstamens, there's a lot of bees that you'll actually find sleeping in these. So this is a Halictus farinosus, the brown wing bee. The males will actually sleep inside of them. Um, this one came out because I was moving the flower around, but kind of gave me a nice pose. It looks like he's surfing a little bit there. Uh, this is another male Megachile sleeping on a stalk of a uh, flower stalk. Um, another thing that I think is really great. Uh, so the Xerces Society came out with a campaign called Leave the Leaves. Because um, leaves are a really valuable organic matter to build up a healthy soil. Um, so they also work as weed suppression and moisture retention, um, butterflies, bees, wasps, a lot of things over winter in them. So they kind of work as a blanket. So I always recommend if you can leave your leaves instead of mulching. Um, I know mulching can work great for water retention as well, but if you have more than like two to three inches of it, it can actually suffocate anything that's living in the ground. So uh, leave the leaves instead. Um, and as far as bee houses, I know a lot of people design bee houses for bees, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're healthy for bees. Um, so I actually like to recommend one that I think works really well um, to create like a a healthy house for bees. So this is wee bee houses. Um, and one thing that you always need for a bee houses, it needs to be at least six inches deep 
And it also needs to be something that you can actually clean. So I compare it to like a dog house. So let's say you have a, a dog house that's outside and your dog lives in there like 24 seven, but you've never cleaned it out in years. Uh, your dog can get really sick for that from that. So the same thing can happen with bees. So um, they actually sent me one of their bee houses just to kind of demonstrate. So I'll take this apart really quick. I don't know if you guys can see this, but um, so female bees can actually control if they're laying a male or female egg. So typically what they do is they lay a male egg closer to the entrance and a female egg closer to the back. So males emerge first. That's also why they're smaller as well. So when you have a bee house, you want to have one that you can actually take apart the columns. And see here how it comes apart. Oops. And you can see the little cells here that the bees will use to nest in. And then you also want to clean these out after. And once you clean them out, you don't want to put the, the cocoons back in the cells because, again, it's sometimes kind of difficult to tell male from female cocoons. So I always recommend getting a bee house that has a shelf in it. So this is actually at the, the top of the bee house here. You can actually just put the cocoons back in here. There's a little hole that they're exit from so they can emerge in the order that they're supposed to. Um, so the, the bee house in the photo is an observation one. So you can actually look at them from the side. You can tell that these are leaf cutter bees because these are little cut cutouts of leaves, kind of like I was talking before. Um, but yeah, we bee house make really great bee houses for bees. Um, this is another product that is advertised for bees, but it's not bee appropriate. So like I was saying before, they need to be at least six inches deep. This one's not. Um, it's more so, um, I think this, this is just kind of, there's a lot of things that are designed for bees that people just like kind of make a lot of money off of, but they aren't really beneficial. And there's really no way to clean these off as well. Um, yeah, so what can happen is if you don't ever clean these off, a lot of times there's mite infestations. So this is what's happening on these Osmia bees right here, these mason bees. They're covered with mites. And it doesn't just affect the bees living in the bee houses that you have. It can affect the other ones as well that are mating. Um, one thing that I think that you can potentially do is if you do find a bee house that is um, appropriate for bees, but you can't clean it out, I always recommend that you get um, biodegradable paper straws and you can actually put them in the... Um, the, the space for the bees. And um, you can take them out at the end of the season, just basically unwrap them, clean them off, and then put them in the drawer in your bee house. So these are some instructional videos that actually walk you through cleaning bee houses and the bee cocoons. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to write that down. Um, but one thing I also like to mention about this as well is that um, a lot of times people want to bring bees into their yard. So they'll actually purchase bees online. So just because you're purchasing a bee that's not a honeybee doesn't mean it's necessarily native to your area. So you can actually be in introducing another type of bee that's not native. So what I would always do is just put out the bee house or and just see what it attracts. But also too, if you have like a native yard, you don't even need to put out bee houses because I feel like a lot of times they are more for people. But again, um, companies like We Bee House design really great bee houses. So if you do want one, they're a great place to go. Okay. And then also too, I mentioned this briefly before, but people put water out for bees. And I was saying that it's not native bees that are attracted to these. And if you notice here, what kind of bee is attracted to them? Honeybees. So if you're doing native landscaping and you want to put water resources out for bees, you don't have to do that. They get all of their water from plants or all of their hydration from plants. So um, this is actually my hand. This is a, a female carpenter bee that was stuck in between my friend's window um, panes. And I just included this photo because if you do want to, if you do see a bee that's sort of down or like tired, um, I would never give them honey, even if it's a honey bee, um, unless you knew it was from the hive where you got the honey because you can be spreading pathogens between bees. So what I always recommend you do is give them a mixture of three parts water to one part sugar. Um, so that's what I did for this bee. She'd been stuck in between the window panes for like hours. And after about 10 minutes of her just drinking this mixture, she got up and flew away. So something great you can do there. And then I think it was D before who was actually asking about what I use for photography. So I, I decided to include um, this part very last minute. 
Um, but I actually created this just to show you angles to photograph for ID. So um, in the lateral view or the side view, always get a shot of the antennae because you can actually count the antennae segments and tell males from females. So females have 12 antennae segments, antennae segments and males have 13. Um, also the head shape can um, distinguish between different genera of bees a lot. Um, it could even help you distinguish between species. Um, also get a sh shot of the uh, the turga right here, which is kind of like the shoulder joint where the wing attaches. If you get shots of the wings, you can actually tell again males from females. Um, shots of the abdomen, you can see the different bands on the abdomen, how the hair lays, and if there's hair on the underside of the, the abdomen, it can actually help you distinguish between family of bees. Um, with this one, the face shot, again, the antennae. So you can, if you actually can count these, you can see there's one, two, three. Um, these are different antennae segments. So he'll have 13, and this is the female osmia. She'll have 12. Again, the head shape. If you get a shot of the facial features, like I was saying with the osmia before, um, the males a lot of times will have facial hair. Um, they also might have a clippiest facial feature, not the osmia, but that will tell you it's a male. Um, for the osmia in particular, if you get a shot of the mandibles, that's a great way to distinguish between species. For the dorsal or from the top view, again, the antennae, shape of the head. So this is actually a diadacia, which you can kind of look at their heads. It's sort of shaped like a ball. Um, that's a really great way to tell um, what genus it is, I think. Um, but then also here on the wings, you can see three little cells in between wings called some marginal cells. If you get shots of some, some marginal cells, you can actually sometimes ID from tribe, genus, or uh, subgenus of bee. And then the posterior shot or from behind, you can actually tell males from females on um, some sweat bees uh, just by looking at the last band on the abdomen. Also the way the hair lays, you can tell the difference between like a helictus or a ligaceous. So different sweat bees that look really similar. Um, you can also tell um, if a bee is like a melisotis or a Kylie just based on the way the hair lays back here. So those are good angles to photograph for ID. Um, if you don't want to invest in a camera, you can get these clip-on attachments for your cell phone. These are really great. Um, I actually used these for a while with these, I think I shot with a Samsung S6 or a Galaxy S6. Um, so you can get really good photos with your phone. And these are, this is obviously like a really old phone, but got really great shots of this um, leaf cutter bee. And you can tell she's a female again because of the plumose hair on the underside of her abdomen. Some flashes. I know a lot of times when you want to get into macro photography, for whatever reason, camera stores always recommend a ring light. I think personally, a ring light is the worst flash to get for macro photography because it leaves a hot spot on whatever you're photographing that's in the shape of a circle. So it's really, really distracting. Um, when I started macro photography, I used dual flashes, which I think work really well. Um, you can just kind of angle them whatever way you like and wrap the light around the subject. I ended up switching though to single flash, which is what I actually currently use just because this got really heavy. I actually dropped about three pounds when I switched from the dual flash to the single flash. Um, this was my setup with the dual flash. So I actually had um, two soft boxes that I bought on eBay and they had arms that I could move around here. And then um, this is a piece of polypropylene that I actually put in front of each of the soft boxes to soften the light. And that's the view from the front. So this is what I currently use. Um, I recommend AK diffusers or Cygnus Tech. At the moment, I use Cygnus Tech, and I think it's a really, really great diffuser. Um, I think AK diffusers is based in Florida. Cygnus Tech is based in Australia. Um, but yeah, really, really both great companies. Um, so what diffusers actually do is when you have the flash, um, like I was talking before about like the hot spot when you have like a ring light, which is shaped like a ring, when you have a single diffuser or a single flash or a double flash, you can potentially have two hot spots. So this is an example of a hot spot. It's basically where the flash is just really bright on whatever it is you're um, photographing. And it basically creates a void of information. So if you're ever editing your photos, like this is just gonna stay this color. But when you have a diffuser, it really softens it up. So you don't have those hot spots and it kind of just like softens the image wraps around. Um, this is also a single image with the diffuser. This one's a stacked without the diffuser. So, um, yeah. And then I actually have two cameras right now. So I shoot with a Nikon D500. That's what most of these photos were taken with. This is a crop sensor camera. 
And I think it was actually just discontinued um, last year. So if you still get it, it's, it's definitely going to be discounted. And it's a great camera, I think, to start out with. Um, so crop sensors are really great because if you're shooting a lot of small things, it makes the small things a lot bigger. They fill up with a lot more of the frame. Um, this is what I currently use. It's a Nikon Z9. It's a mirrorless camera, and I absolutely love this one. Um, it's I, I feel it's a little overpriced, but I mean, it's it's definitely worth it. It's a great camera. Um, but yeah, this one's really just, it's just amazing, like what you can do with this camera. And I got like knocking it out of the park with this. Um, my primary lens is at Nikkor 105 f2.8. So 105 millimeters, that's the distance between the sensor and the back of the camera and whatever the subject is. So if you're using, um, if you're photographing things that like to fly away from you a lot, I would start with a 105 opposed to like a 50 millimeter or an 80 millimeter, just because it gives you more working distance. Um, Tamron also came out with this nice lens. Um, I think it's slightly sharper than Nikon's, but they're both really good lenses. So 90 millimeters, like slightly less working distance than the 105. Um, reverse mount ring. So if you, um, already have a camera set up, but you don't want to buy a, um, like a macro lens, you can actually just, uh, buy a reverse ring mount. I think they're like 30 bucks. So what it basically does is you actually take off your lens and you shoot shoot through it backwards. So it's kind of like looking through a binoc binoculars backwards. So instead of looking at things really far away, like making them closer, it kind of makes things close bigger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is a really great option. Um, also extension tubes. I don't personally use these, um, but for long focal lengths, like 70 millimeters or above, um, a diopter is more effective, and I'll tell you what that guy is in a second. Um, for short focal lengths, like 70 and below, diopters um, really have no effect, but uh, one of these extension tubes is really effective to increase magnification. Um, this is a diopter that I use. Um, this is the 105, so it's really great for the whole body of a bee as well as the flower. Um, these are some photographs that I took with this diopter, and I put it on my Nikkor 105, so it's just like a magnifying glass that you clip onto the front of your lens. So again, you get the whole body of the bee. And this is one coming out of her ground burrow. And this is a um, Bombus melanopygus queen. Oh, and one thing that's really cool about this bee too is um, this bee actually shows up earlier in drought years. So if you're familiar with this bee at all, if you see it in your yard, it's pretty common in California. Um, they typically show up in like February, but like the last three years they started showing up like earlier and earlier to last year when they were in December. Also photograph this with the 150. This is the 250. So this is more magnification on the 105 Nikon lens. Um, so this bee is pretty small, um, actually sort of small. I'd say she's about maybe 10 to 12 millimeters. Um, this is a male that was sleeping perched on a flower. Um, this is again, the Nomata bee. The brachymalectica. Um, also, I have a wide angle macro lens. So if you get this one, it's fully manual. So you can't do autofocus in this at all. I always recommend a lens, lens filter with this because a lot of times what you're shooting, you'll actually put right up against the lens. So this, this is a really cool lens for like really close details on whatever it is you're shooting, but it also gives you a lot of background information. So this is an example of that. So this flower was actually right up against the lens but you can also see what's happening in the rest of the background. So this was at the Crescent Farm at the LA Arboretum. Um, did the same thing, this was at Madrona Marsh. Um, so this is a Bombus sonoris. They have a really good population of this bee, which is a vulnerable bee. Vulnerable bee. Um, there it is again, this was maybe last September, October when it was dry, it's all flooded right now. Um, this is a, a diadacea. In Nevada, which is a sunflower bee. So it's a bee that has a relationship with these. It's a male sleeping on there. Gives you a lot of context in this photo. Um, this is a Lauer 25 millimeter. Um, so this is what I use to shoot anything that's under five millimeters. So it's a 2.5 to five times ultra macro lens. So this is the one that I used for the Perdita minima, the smallest known bee in North America. I also use it for the, the wasp. That's the parasite to the um, aphid also used it for the thrips as well. Um, with this one, they recommend that you would get the ring light for it. But again, 
I'm not a really big fan of the ring light, but if you get one of the diffusers from like AK Diffuser or Cygnus Tech, they actually have a focus light on there. Um, just because this is basically like shooting through a magnifying glass, you need light to, to take photos with this lens. Um, again, completely manual. So I used it to photograph this bee, which is a uh, male Lassie Glossum dialectus on some yarrow, um, the Perdita interrupta, the Perdita minima. Yeah. All right. So I uh, just wanted to go over some of my goals with you guys. Um, so one of my goals is to photograph the four endangered bumblebees in California. Photographed one so far. I tried to photograph a second one about two years ago. I'm going back to the Sierras and the Trinity Alps in like June, July to try and get at least another two. Uh, we'll see what happens. I uh, also want to encourage more people to get into community science. Um, so this is another example of community science at work that I think is really, really great. So in May 2021, a four-year-old actually rediscovered these bees in Palo Alto. So uh, these bees are not native. They were actually brought in to a university by a researcher. And <clears throat> I think it was in the 1950s. And the bees just completely disappeared. Like people thought they had like died out or something. But this four-year-old, because she had an aunt who was very into ecology, started talking to her about different insects, a lot of different creatures. And the four-year-old saw these and was like, these are really unique. I haven't seen these before. Um, she ended up making the news. You can actually um, look up her aunt online um, on it, iNaturalist under this. Her name's Robin. But yeah, I just I think it's a really cool find, and she's keeping track of um, the different colonies of these bees in the Palo Alto Palo, Palo Alto area. Um, but yeah, also um, I want to. Um, there's, there's 1600, over 1,600 species of bees in California. I think it'd be great if when people think of bees, they thought of more than just honeybees. Um, I also want to promote and create native landscaping bridges. So an example would be like my friend Paloma's yard again. She had the, the rare bee and the endangered bee. What would happen if she moved and the people who moved in decided to just put in a green lawn? Where would all of those creatures go? So I like to encourage people to plant at least a small area of native plants in their yard. So these creatures have sort of like bridges between um, areas to go to. They have options. Um, also want to uh, finish a coffee table book that I'm working on um, right now. Um, and then also some flashcards. I actually did a Kickstarter at the beginning of this year, which was successful. Uh, the cards should be, this is the, the first version of the cards, so they don't really look like this anymore, but um, they'll be out in mid-July, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to leave you guys with is this, which is an amazing documentary. It was a man's pandemic project. Um, so since he couldn't leave the house and he had a native yard, he decided to just film everything that showed up in his yard. It's called uh, My Garden of a Thousand Bees. It's free to watch on PBS, and it's just an amazing documentary of what can happen in your heart if you just um, maintain a native ecosystem. And I, I just think it's really wonderful. So you guys should uh, definitely check it out. All right, thank you. Oh, that was great. And uh, so much detail in those photos. Uh, there's a few uh, questions in the in the chat. One of them was was mine. I noticed mm -hmm. that sometimes you've got photos of the bees that are on your finger or your palm or something like that. Yeah. I I wonder if there's any any techniques um, to to do that. Any tips or techniques, or do you just kind of pick them up and plop them down? <laughs> um, so there's a couple of different things. Normally they're like males, so it's early in the morning and they're just waking up. So uh, your finger's like the warmest thing around them. So you just put your finger out and they'll crawl right on. And you can just kind of use that as a uh, stand to take photos of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, Carolyn uh, was asking what the name of the wasp was, the frequent brittle bush. Oh, uh, oh, the, was it a brachioid? You know, let me check. I'm not sure. Okay. And then she has a, a follow-up question. Yes. Um, she says, is it found throughout uh, all the areas where brittle bush is native? I'm sorry, one more time. She's asking if it's found everywhere that brittle bush is found. Okay, yeah, as far as Southern California, yes, it's found all throughout Southern California. 
Um, let me actually go back because I think I put the name of the wasp in there. But yeah, and they're very easy to pho photograph too. They do not move. There it is. Oh. Boy, that looks amazing. Yeah. Um, Dee was saying thank you for the tips. I think in with regard to the photography yeah, equipment and techniques and uh, whatnot, she'd asked about that earlier. Um, I'm scrolling up and then I'll scroll back down. I see there's some new questions. Uh, Angel dropped a link to the PBS show you just mentioned. Dee is asking if she can shadow you on one of uh, your B trips. Is that something? Yeah, sure. Offer? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was actually trying to do trips earlier this year, but then the rain delayed everything. So um, I want to reschedule one to Red Rock in the Mojave Desert. Um, but yeah, she just reaches out to me because I'm pretty much out every single day. Ooh, and that is yeah. a prime invitation right there. Watch out, you might get flooded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Uh, Jean Bellman says, great talk, Crystal. There are a couple other very complimentary uh, comments as well. Uh, Marsha Henscom says, you are amazing. Thank you for the work you're doing, including spreading the facts about these bees. Uh, Dee's going to DM you directly or right away. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Are, is there anybody else that's got a question? I guess um, I don't have a full view of all the participants. There's over 40 um, earlier. So maybe you could just go off mute and ask a question um, if I pause here. Al is asking, um, can you use the daylight without flash? Oh, I see. You just use natural lighting. or And also, do you use a tripod? Um, yeah, you could definitely use uh, daylight without flash. Um, but personally, using a flash does make your photos look better just because a lot of the bees, they're moving really quickly. So the flash actually freezes them in motion. Um, so even like wing venation, sometimes you'll get that in the shots. Um, and as far as tripods, I don't use tripods. Everything's handheld. All right. Cynthia Luna says, thank you very much. Is there anyone yeah. online that just wants to speak up? I'll pause. Yeah. yeah. And sorry, my rabbit is chewing on a box down here. So let me uh -oh. just move. <laughs> I, have a, I, have a, I have a question, Crystal. You mentioned, um, which I found fascinating, that you found all of those bees in the parking lot with the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. And I just wonder, yes. you said that it they ended up getting protected, which is so great because I'm always so worried about all of these big, huge machinery um, <laughs> laden projects that are supposed to be restoration and mm -hmm. they disturb the soils because we have lots of ground nesting bees, as you know. And so I'm just wondering who helped you get that area protected? You said it got protected. Was it the Fish and Wildlife Service? Was it the National Park Service? Who who said, okay, we're going to protect this? Yeah, so it was actually my, um, I was working with my friend James Carey, because he's the one who's out there every day. Um, so the, um, it was the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy who actually approached him and asked him what he was doing. And then they ended up getting it uh, protected through him. Like he has an actual like pass to go out to different areas and find these bees every year and put up cones. Ah, okay. Well, I'm I'm going to be contacting you also. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, Thank and I could um so I'll put you in contact with their information too if you'd like. Great. Uh, this is D again. I just put a question in um for crystal is do you do photo stacking for you um at all or sometimes or yeah sometimes i do um not as much anymore because i kind of like the shallower depth of field on things but um yeah i do handheld photo stacking oh great okay thanks <laughs> yeah no problem all right any other photos all right <laughs> Any other questions, actually? Um, oh, Marsha has dropped a note in um, that someone would like to get in touch for a tour of a couple of important places where you may not know there are significant ground nesting bee populations. Oh, Marsha has probably got some good spots. I would so. Oh. Um, if you look in, in the chat, 
uh, she's at uh, wetland act at earthlink.net. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and also if you wouldn't mind emailing me as well, um, hello at VSIP. Um, I'm not oh, yeah. sure where your message is. Yeah, I will for sure. All right. Okay, and, uh, so, thank you. All right, and uh, Dee, is, Dee says that she's looking forward to seeing the first part that she missed when she uh, on YouTube. So that's going to be a, a real bonus for people. Uh, Larissa says, thank you very much. Sounds like there's just a lot of people that totally appreciated this, as, as did I. So thank you also from, from yeah. me. It was very nice. Um, Actually, I had a question. Um, I saw your presentation at the CMPS Conservation Conference, and you mentioned that one of your goals back then was to photograph, I think, the four endangered bumblebee species. Have you gotten around to doing that? Um, I've only photographed. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, I've only photographed one so far. Um, so I've gotten the male, the workers, and the queens for that one. Um, I tried two years ago to photograph um, Bombus Franklini in the Trinity Alps that no one has seen since 2006. Um, but yeah, this year I'm going to the Trinity Alps and the Sierras in June and July to try and get um, Occidentalis, which is the, the Western bumblebee, as well as Franklin Eye again. Um, what was that? Oh, it sounded like there's just a, an audio issue. I, I think maybe continue, continue your thought. I think someone's mic was open. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was it. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to try again in June and July. So fingers crossed, but they're kind of hard to find. <laughs> oh, all right. I'll, I'll wait just another minute for one last question because we're coming up on the hour. This is Roy. I'd like to ask a question of the excellent speaker tonight. Go, go ahead, Roy. Okay. Um, have you been to Pacoima Wash near Silmar area and to Hunga Wash as places? It seems like you're going everywhere in LA and the Biona wetlands uh, is, is an ecological reserve. And oh. I think we have about four species of bumblebees that have been found there. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just wondering if those are some of your field spots that you've gone to look. Yeah, I go to the to Hunga Wash pretty regularly. Um, haven't been to the other locations though. You said okay. it was Bologna Wash and where else? Pacoima Wash near LA Mission Pacoima? College and Silmar. Oh, no, I haven't been to those. There's some really great wildflowers and desert. Oh, I was curious about cactus. Have you been getting any photographs of bees at our native cactus plant flowers? Yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely diadacia. And there's one that I'm, it's, I'm kind of, it's late for it right now, but there's one called a micra andrina, um, where the males are just groups of males sleep in the cactus flowers. Um, those I was looking for in Indian wells, but um, they're, they're basically done by March, but you'll, you'll probably see like a lot of diadacia sleeping in them still right now. Thank you. It sounds like you're saying cactus flowers are important potentially as- yeah. Habitat. And then I wanted to steer you towards uh, Dr. Anstruther Davidson from a century ago. A century ago. Oh. He, he, um, he published an article in the early oh, bulletin of the California Academy of Sciences, and it's called Bumblebees of Los Angeles County. And it was in Southern, yes, Los Angeles County region. And that means all the way up to about Tehachapi and then down, mm -hmm. you know, through our area. And he had something like a dozen species of bumblebees on his list for Los Angeles region. And that was a century ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. Anstruther, yeah. Anstruther Davidson. And he was as much interested in botany as insects. But okay. Yeah. How do you spell his first name? Uh, A-N-S-T-R-U-T-H-E-R. Okay. He was a dermatologist and a Scottish immigrant uh, from Scotland and good okay. friends with John Muir and also uh, that oh. really interesting person to, oh, my net website, naturespeace.org. I think I might have typed and transcribed his article. Um, oh, okay. Might find it there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll look for that. Cause yeah, that's a lot more um, typically now anyways. Um, 
there's five bumblebees that people primarily see. And then like, if you go out to the mountains and um, the Mojave Desert, there's there's one out there, but it's rarely seen. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank it's great information. Thank you. All right, last call, last call. All right, well, thank you so much, Crystal. That was wonderful. I'm gonna stop the recording.